Welcome to the Paperless Productivity Podcast, where we give you the tips, tricks, and know-how to solve your biggest workflow challenges and bring greater productivity into your workplace every day. Welcome to this week's episode. And if you're in the court space, then this episode is for you. So many courts are trying to find ways to be more efficient without ripping out all of their old systems, trying to find technology that's going to work for them to help them to uh, manage their caseload and to address the changing needs of today's modern courts, but without having to go through a major strategy and major technology overall. So today we're going to be talking about the component model and the National Center for State Courts and Community Live and how all of these things are all converging together. So Kevin Legister of ImageSoft is going to be talking and taking us through this today, and we will explore this in today's episode. All right. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, first of all, let me just start off by just um, explaining a little bit about what the component model is that's being promoted by the National Center for State Courts. And if you're a court listener, you may be familiar with this. You most certainly have heard about this. Maybe you were at the National Center, the National Association for Court Managers show, um, or any one of the shows where you, you may have heard one of these things mentioned in a seminar. The component model really came out of this this whole idea in terms of just naturally seeing where, where courts were heading. It used to be in the olden days, I say the olden days, really we're only talking a few years ago, right. but in technology, olden days is like <laughs> what happened last, last year. year. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with respect to that, so it used to be that you know, the recommendation was buy your solution from a from a technology vendor that can provide you the entire stack of of your technology needs. So it would be a, a, a vendor that could provide you with your, your case management, could provide you with e-filing, could provide you with... Um, you know, your, your judge interface, um, your e-bench solution. So you would have everything, you know, right within that one package. Well, the reality is, is that as courts progress and courts, you know, would, would buy onto this, first of all, they found it would be very, very expensive to do this. So as a result, what happened is that a lot of courts that couldn't afford the $1 million, $2 million, or $5 million, whatever it would cost to to ri- essentially rip out their entire, you know, core of their technology to replace it with an, another vendor's offering – what happened was that those courts just got stuck in time and they weren't able to move forward in terms of uh, implementing new features. And maybe their case management solution did everything they needed to do except for one small piece of functionality that they needed. Or maybe they just need to integrate e-filing with it uh, so that people can electronically file. Or maybe they just need to handle their documents through Microsoft Word and, and doing Word templates much more efficiently and being able to update them as opposed to programmatically going in and changing those. So it was just these small bits of functionality that a lot of times the courts were looking for and they couldn't get to without ripping out the whole entire infrastructure and changing it for something new. So the National Center for State Courts really looked at this and came along and updated their their thought process in terms of, well, instead of just trying to rip everything out and tear it all out, really what we should be promoting is this idea of being able to have interoperability between applications. Mm-hmm. So and so with respect to that, a court could say, you know, I've got this case management solution and I want to be able to, to handle the, the, the development of judges' orders and things like that using Microsoft Word as opposed to something that's really just code-based that's inside our legacy application and being able to just buy that functionality that, that could easily just essentially just snap on to to what they currently have. And so instead of spending $2 million for a whole new thing, mm-hmm. they could spend maybe you know $100,000 and you really get this new functionality and be able to, to, to really to, to, to bring their court into the modern space. So that's really where that comes from in terms of this component model is, is, is having technology partners and technology vendors really develop their applications in such a way that it, it tends to be much more open and that courts can implement pieces of, as to what they need to, as opposed to having to, you know, rip, essentially rip and replace um, their, their entire technology stack. And I would imagine that there would be some concern about that, because if you've already paid for the investment of some some massive legacy system that is just, you know, even though it's no longer doing the job that you need it to anymore, I'm sure there's a lot of hesitation about just having it go completely out the window because there's probably elements of it that are still useful, but it's just not meeting the needs of what you need for today. Uh, so I would imagine that having this component model is probably helping to address some of those concerns, uh, you know, thinking, well, we, we already paid for this this massive system. We already invested so much uh that that 
they may be hesitant to include a new system. Um, so, yeah. so perhaps being able to add on these things that address those new needs uh, could be really attractive. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, there is a lot of hesitation, and and you know, if you're in a small county, it becomes extremely expensive to to rip and replace with these newer systems. So, if your county only has a hundred thousand people in there, and you get a proposal for two million dollars to add on to to basically to tear out your whole entire system, that becomes very very expensive. And That's shocking, I, I bet. <laughs> and I. I you know, the, the moment that somebody comes up for election and says, you know, your opponent comes up and says, hey, this is a big budget issue and, mm-hmm. and you, you essentially have to raise taxes to, to pay for this, that that becomes a challenging notion. Not to mention the fact that, you know, it's not just the cost. The cost mm-hmm. is just one, one area. But there's, there's, another, there's another area that we have to think about, too. And that is anytime you rip out core technology and put something else new in that's that different, you take that person that's got 20, 30, years of experience and you turn them into a person that really is essentially a newbie. Mm, It's their first day on the job. So you lose a lot of that experience with respect to that. Now, there are some cases where you do need to replace your your core systems, your your case management system, for instance, if that becomes the the need because it's just so old, it's no longer supported, there's security concerns. Mm -hmm. But you're right. In many cases, that's not the case. That's not the driving factor. Driving factor is, is, they they want to have electronic filing for their constituents and for attorneys so that they can reduce the amount of line you know lines that show up at the courthouse every day to file papers um they want to have more advanced document preparation capabilities they want to have bring electronic records into the courtroom mm-hmm. and give the judges more ability to search you know across different uh, cases and to search related cases and to be able to add in his judge notes as opposed to, you know, writing them, scribbling them on a post-it note somewhere. And then the court clerk's got to take that and, you know, transfer that into the case management system. And, you know, everybody's duplicating what, what everybody else is doing. So, so yeah, y- yes, you're exactly right. So, so that's one of the things that we see from the court perspective in terms of recognizing the reality of it mm-hmm. and saying, this is really the direction that we need to go because no one vendor is going to be able to provide everything that you need for the modern court. It's, it's okay. just as impossible. And even if they said that they can, most organizations can't do everything well. They can do two or three things really well, and then everything else is kind of a also ran. Mm-hmm. So, the, anyways, yeah. No, I was going to say it. It seems like, in some ways, the efficiency of having a one stop shop for software seems like it would make a lot of sense. So I could see the the mindset and the thought behind that. But it sounds like in this case, it really, courts are going to be best served by going with organizations where they have a, a particular strength and being able to work with them with their software systems that that really address specific needs rather than, like you said, one one organization that claims to be able to handle everything well. Yes. And, and that's, you know, and some of this is just left over from from the previous decade mm-hmm. in terms of technology, where there was this idea that, uh, you know, there's not invented here approach. So okay. if we didn't invent it, we don't want you to buy it type of thing. We oh, want you to do everything okay. with us. Yeah. So so a lot of these technology partners that are out there, while they claim that they can integrate and, and the, in their, they can interoperate with other applications, they're not really set up to do that. Their, okay. their applications aren't set up to do that. It costs a lot of money to create even a single integration, and the court can't even do it themselves. It's something the vendor has to do, and it becomes a very expensive proposition. So a lot of times it just doesn't happen because a lot of vendors, this is the way they approach this, their philosophy, and uh, it, it just makes it a challenge for them. And, that, and that's one of the things that you know that we've tried to do in terms of our approach has always been that you know, we want to make sure that whatever we we put in, our philosophy has been let's let's complement what you have. Let's let's work alongside. So in, in a sense, we kind of pioneered the the component model, mm-hmm. and um, for for our customers, and that's something that we want to see a lot more in the industry. Is is more people, you know, getting onto this bandwagon and, and making it possible. You know, because you can be about. You know, we believe in making justice available for all. That's what we want to do. So, mm-hmm. so we want to make courts become as modern as possible. And and I think as other 
uh, partners that are out there and other courts and court ad- admins are out there. They're all asking for the same thing. And this is really where the industry is driving at is, hey, everybody, we need to be able to play nice together. We actually saw this in the banking industry many years ago where it had the, they had the same same thought process was everybody was you know, just trying to go with their one core provider for everything. And they realized that they were not getting the best of what they could possibly do okay. that the bank could do, you know, the technology vendor could do, you know, two or three things well and not, and the other things were just kind of also rands and they ended up having to go outside anyways. And then they didn't talk well together. It just caused a lot of issues. So having this in our modern day, this, this idea of being interoperable, this, this component model where, you know, I can, you know, you can, you can purchase, you know, a small bit of functionality from one provider, get an, and another one and put those together easily and even have the court engage with that process as well. And being able to take advantage of that, that will allow courts to become modern much quicker, much faster, to much lower cost. And the taxpayers are the ones that benefit from that because not only do they get justice served to them easier mm-hmm. and at a lower cost and much more efficiently and in timely fashion, but it just means that we don't have to raise taxes as much to re- rip and replace systems that are functioning perfectly well. Okay. And this was really covered uh, pretty heavily and pretty well at Community Live recently, which is uh, Highland's big customer event. So first, can you can you explain uh, who Highland is, what ImageSoft's connection is with Highland, and uh, and then what Community Live is and, and how this all came together? Sure. So so we're, we're seeing this convergence happen. So we're seeing this in the court space, but we're seeing this happen in other places. So Highland Software is a company out of Cleveland, Ohio, that is uh, – is one of the the leaders in the document management workflow case management content services they've there's all different terminology in terms of way of thinking about it but they're they're the one of ones that you know the the kings that are out there in terms of what they do and the organizations that they've helped they're all over the world um they've got over 10,000 different customers uh, and and uh they they've just uh, succeeded where um you know if you look at uh you know, Gartner as one of the organizations out there that, that rank these different organizations, they always seem to be in the leader quadrant for, for what they do. So, so they're, they're doing it really well. And they have this philosophy in terms of integration. So they want to integrate with everybody as easy as possible and simple as possible. They want to complement systems that are in currently in the workplace as opposed to ripping and replacing that out. And they also want to make their, their, their technology accessible Mm -hmm. so that instead of requiring somebody with a high degree of technical skill that's required to deploy even a simple solution, they've designed it. So people who are like a super user or a, you know, a business analyst can really deploy, you know, some fairly sophisticated solutions and, and just rely on their partners for those, you know, really technical things and, you know, you know, that, that they would, that they would need. So that's kind of the genesis in terms of who they are and, and, and how they've grown and, and, uh, uh, Amazon has been a partner of of Highland Software for many many years, uh, for for over two decades, or well, almost almost two decades that we've been a partner of Highland Software, and uh, so we've grown with them. And so because that's the philosophy that they've taken, mm-hmm. that's also the philosophy that we've taken as well. So every year they have an annual event which they call Community Live, which is their user conference. There's people that come from all over the world, um, these users, executives, uh, leaders that come in and they talk about you know. Tr- you know, topics and trends that are happening in the industry, mm-hmm. as well as, you know, what's happening, you know, how is, how is Highland meeting that with their solutions and, and how they can help organizations to, and to become more efficient and more effective in terms of, in terms of what they do. So at this last conference, which they had in Nashville, um, which I love because that's kind of my stomping grounds mm-hmm. and, uh, and everybody loved it. And even if you're not a country music fan, it was fun to go down there and, <laughs> and, uh, and enjoy some uh, rich uh, country traditions in uh, downtown Nashville. But at this at this recent con- conference, they were talking a lot about what they call content services. And what content services means for them um, is that there there are pieces of functionality that that you can make available to a device. So, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a simple example of that. Um, most of you who are listening on on this podcast probably have a smartphone, and you could take this this smartphone and take a photo of a document, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's not really efficient to put on your smartphone the ability to take that document and to optically read all the characters on that. That that requires, you know, another application to do that. It makes sense to say, I'm going to take a picture of this document and then I'm going to hit a button 
and then some server somewhere is going to take a look at this document in a cloud somewhere. It's going to look at that, read the document, convert it to text so it's searchable, and grab some information off of that and populate maybe fields that are on on your actual device. Okay. So that's the idea of content services is that you can c- take these small bits of functionality and make them accessible and available to everybody. So when we link that now to the component model, it's almost the same parallel thing. This whole idea where a court can say, I just need this piece of functionality. I just need to add on this new accounting functionality. I just need this document creation functionality. Maybe I just need to have mobile access to my files. So instead of having to purchase this whole entire stack and this whole huge infrastructure, I now can just bite off that piece and integrate it easily with my system and uh, you know, increase my effectiveness, increase my efficiency and, and, and what we can do. So that's that's what the... That's what we saw community live in terms of content services, in terms of where the industry is growing. That's where CIO, CIOs, you know, chief information officers and IT um, execs that are out there, that's what they're asking for as well as more and more people are asking for this idea that we can uh, create this interoperability where we can buy pieces of software, pieces of, of functionality that we can use and integrate easily into our into our technology, into our solutions that make our users more effective and make them more efficient as opposed to I need to buy another server, I need to buy another box, I need to you know set up another server room, another server rack just because I wanted to have this piece of functionality. And, and, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. So we're seeing these two worlds coming together. Okay. And we think that just means a, a huge amount, not only for courts, but really for anybody that could be listening to this podcast in any organization in terms of being able to advance the ball down the field in terms of yeah, how you do business. Okay. So say some organizations, they're, they're starting to see that, okay, this could really work for the way that, that our courts are operating or the way that our business is, or is operating. What are some of the questions that they should ask uh, of, of any software provider that they're working with to make sure that this kind of interoperability and, and these, this kind of integration is going to be able to happen? So they, they start exploring systems and trying to figure out, uh, you know, which system they want to go with and, and which ones are going to work the best for them. What are some key questions that they should ask their software providers? Oh, wow. That, that, those, that's a great question because everybody that's out there says we can integrate. Sure. So that's, that's the one that, um, you know, how do you get around that? One, one of the questions I, I, I would ask is, you know, there's actually several questions that I would ask. One of them would, would simply be, who have you integrated with? And, and that's one of the questions that, that, that needs to be asked is, you know, have you integrated with, you know, our system? Have you integrated systems like ours? You know, and, and that's, and that's an important question to ask is because then that, that helps to weed out and see, you know, have they actually done this type of work before? The, the other, the other thing that you need to ask is, well, what's your methodology for, for, for doing this? How do you approach integrations? And, and that's another question that you can, you can very, very quickly tell that if somebody can't explain to you their methodology, how they approach integrations, they probably aren't very strong at it. What they, what they might have is they might have what we call an application programming interface, what we call an API. They might just have something that's out there and, and maybe a, a glossary or, or a book in terms of here's how you integrate and they throw the book at you and say, you know, go to it. Th- there oh, you go. Okay. Or, or, or they may be somewhat secretive in terms of, well, we handle it all. We take care of it all. And what that really means is they have to go back and to make that integration work, they actually have to go in and write lines of code and recompile the software so that you have a unique version that actually integrates with with your stuff and and that you don't want because then it becomes harder to support you. So so those are some things that the questions that you want to ask is you know you know who have you done this with before um what is your methodology in term, terms of how you approach and the the third thing is the third question I would ask is is simply this and and this is probably the biggest giveaway and this is the number one question that I would simply ask is if we want to do an integration ourselves, is it possible? And that tells you how open they are or how closed off they are. And if they say, yeah, you, you can do that, um, you know, here's the tools, here's the book. We even provide, you know, there's training that you can take so you can create your own integrations and you can take this to the next level. You can integrate other applications with it so that, the, you know, maybe a court or organization could take some of this on if they have sophisticated, you know, people in their technical department then that get, that's a big, huge giveaway in terms of what the capability is. The third thing is, you know, another question to ask is is the question of, you know, if we need help, are you willing to work with our vendors 
to make this possible? That's another great question to ask because a lot of them will say, yes, we can integrate, you know, we can write some code, but they really don't want to talk to your other technology partners. Yeah, yeah. And that is such a huge key because somebody has to take ownership of the process mm -hmm. and somebody has to lead it down through. And it's typically, it's not going to be the court. It's going to be one of the technology vendors that's going to say, hey, I'm willing to corral everybody into a room you know, whether it's a virtual room, let's have this discussion. What do you need from us? What can we get from you? How does your code actually work? And actually work through and lead you through that process so that you end up with a really good result at the end. And that's that's a fantastic question. So they need to be able to play nice with others. They need to be able to play, not only be <laughs> able to play nice with others, but they to be willing to play nice with yeah. others. And unfortunately, too often we've seen a, a too many technology providers, and this is part of the reason why National Center for State Course has been pushing this and trying to get vendors on board is that a lot of them don't want to play nice. They okay. can, but they don't want to because they see that as risking sale of one of their own products as opposed to saying that we're really open. So we, we as an industry, uh, we still have to get to that point where, where we're really there. Um, but there are partners that are out there um, that are already at that point that will take you there and will get you there a lot sooner and will get you there a lot more cost effectively as well. Okay. Now, are there any resources that we could point people to where they might be able to learn a little bit more about the the component model or about what the National Center for State Courts uh, is is covering with this? Sure, there's there's all kinds of places where you can certainly if you can go to the National Center for State Courts and you do a search on on their website, they've got all kinds of documents and white papers and essays that you can learn about the component model. Uh, we've actually um, had some articles on it that kind of explain it more from a layman's non technical term where you can actually go to our website at imagesoftinc.com and you can actually access that. As a matter of fact, we'll put the link right in our website where you can go right to that and, and read that article and help explain to you what that means, a little bit more detail. But it just helps you to understand in terms of what the approach is. Um, you know, certainly from a court admin perspective, most court admins are, are really familiar with this and they're asking for this. Mm -hmm. They're asking for more interoperability. Be and part of the reason is, is they just can't get budget to do a, a big, huge wholesale, you know, replacement. So they're asking more for this. So um, if you have any questions about it, certainly go to our website, uh, go to National Center for State Courts. They'll help point you in the right direction as well, too. Or somebody contact us and, and we'll put you in touch. We've got a justice consultant on staff. who has been in the industry for, for over two decades. Um, very familiar with the National Center for State Courts and with the, the different organizations that are involved with some of the, you know, the processes and trying to standardizing, you know, this this type of approach that they would be able to help you out as well, too. Okay, wonderful. Well, I think that we've really done uh, a pretty good deep dive into this topic, and I'm sure there's more that we could we could cover and probably will in, in future episodes. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> it sounds like it's it's a pretty big topic. So. It is a big topic. Uh, but yeah, so we'll we'll probably stop it there and 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 look for more opportunities to discuss this in the future. So thank you so much for taking the time today, Kevin, and we look forward to uh, having you on here again soon. Hey, thank you, Kate. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe so you can make sure to catch every episode of the Paperless Productivity Podcast. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again for joining us today for this episode of Paperless Productivity. This podcast is sponsored by ImageSoft, the paperless process people, which you can learn more about at imagesoftinc.com. That's imagesoftinc.com. Join us next time where you'll learn how to harness the power of technology, supercharge efficiency, and accomplish your organization's goals.